We are on week nine of our core value series. These are the values that we have built uh, the gathering on, but they're not just for our church. They are for our personal lives, for your family, for your business. These are not things that are built around what seems right for 2021. These are not built around the ideas of influential leaders, but this is literally the core values that we find within the word of God that are applicable today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. We've talked about things like honor, integrity, placing a high value on the Holy Spirit in our life. If you guys missed last week, I believe the word, the word of the Lord was perfect for each and every one of us as it talked about how he took what we know in our head and moved it into our heart that we are not in a position where we necessarily need any more information or even a different circumstance, but we just need the revelation of the truth that God has already given us. That We, have, we place a high value on communication. That healthy relationships require healthy communication. That we're going to have to lean into awkward conversations sometimes. <laughs> we're going to have relationship with people. That we weren't built to do life in isolation. But the kingdom of God is a community. That's part of the reason why we call this church the gathering. Ray talked about empowerment. How it's not just about the senior pastor going out there and busting his butt each and every week to make this thing happen. But we come together as a group of individuals that give up their time, their talents, all that they are in order to see the kingdom of God come to earth. I love that. You've seen that in just little ways. My prayer for this year is that we see 12 leaders step up with a passion and a calling in their life that they say, I want to see God do something special in my community. And I'm not just looking for you to make it happen, but I want to take ownership of this thing. That's where you see Carly step up with Undefeated. And we're going to reach the prostitutes. We're going to reach the people in the massage parlors. We're going to reach in, we're in the Philippines, right? And in Africa, uh, all over the place. I love that it's happening overseas, but I love it just as much, maybe even a little bit more that we're happy that it's happening right here in America. I want to touch our, I want to touch our homes. Uh, and so we're seeing the empowerment, health, Spiritual health, you guys see that about every three weeks, three to four weeks, uh, I'm intentionally stepping down and allowing somebody else to speak. It's not because I wasn't able to come up with another message, but I believe that even in the same way that Ray was talking about, that you are empowered to do the work of the ministry, that it's doing a disservice to you if we do not uh, enable those that God has blessed us with to speak into your lives. And so uh, we look towards health, times of rest. I believe the rest is a weekly requirement. That's why he, God put in the top ten there with Moses. You need to have a Sabbath day. You need to have a day of rest, celebration. We learn to celebrate the little things in life, that we don't just look for the finality of whatever that is, it is that we are praying for, but as we walk through the journey of life, we find the little things that God is just egging us along with and saying, hey, I got you. I'm here for you. I know this isn't everything right now, but this is all you need for today. The prayer is give us this day our daily bread, and I will trust you for tomorrow. And so as we close this series out, we're going to talk about generosity. And as I lean into generosity here, I want to ask you the simple question for you to ponder. What are you always doing? What are you always doing? What would your spouse say that you are always doing? I see couples looking at each other saying, video games. No. <laughs> Better yet, what are your kids saying that you're always doing? Remember Ashley? How old was she whenever she thought dad, whenever we lived in St. Louis? Two years old. She used to believe that my father, who traveled a lot... Um, he would fly out, like, what, Saturday? Did he come back on Thursdays normally? So he'd fly out on, on Saturday and come back on Thursdays, and we would always drop him off. And so Ashley was fully convinced at the age of two that what my dad was always doing was he was living at the airport, and that was it. Like, he didn't love us enough to be with us seven days a week. You just, you got to see dad Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then he was out of Gore, not even Sunday. So, yeah, so Ashley believed that what dad was always doing was he was living at the airport. Um, little Tom Cruise thing there, or a Tom Hanks movie. But, um... What are you always doing? I know some of you are here this morning. It might be your first time you're saying, man, I came to church on the generosity Sunday. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about money. This isn't about money. This is about a mindset. Because generosity is not just about money. Sure, there is an outward expression that our money will uh, play a part in this. But I want to look at three key areas. Where generosity is going to play a crucial part in your life. I even got fancy today, y'all, because my buddy Kevin back there on the camera, who I'm going to make blush, came from Saddleback Church, which I love. And Rick Warren always uses notes. You get to fill in a little fill in the blank. So if you get bored, if you check out for a second, you can start trying to guess what the fill in the blanks are. Get you back on track. But we're talking about three key areas. The first one is the area of your talents. 1 Peter 4.10, when we're looking at generosity in the area of our talents, it says, Each of you should use whatever gifts you have 
receive to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If I can bring that up to you in the modern day times, what it's saying is, is look, not only, this is not just like me uh, being humble. Can I just be honest with you as your senior pastor and say, I do not have all the skill sets and equipment needed in order to do what God wants to do here in Prosper. If that was the case, we didn't need to get a facility. We didn't even need to start partnering with each and every one of you to make this happen. Lord and I could have just went out and just took the whole place by force. What he's looking for is saying, will you be generous with your talents? The church needs men and women with strong business mindsets. Stay-at-home parents that love their kids but aren't burning themselves out Monday through Saturday where they're saying, the last thing I want to do now is go work in a kid's ministry. The last thing I want to go do now is take the talents and the God-given gifts that I have and use it one more time on Sunday because I've taken what God's given me and the world recognizes and they would say, I'd pay you money for that. And so I'll give everything I am to the world that's willing to give me a dollar. But when I come back into the house of the Lord, I'm like, "Ah, I'll just sit back and kind of watch for a little bit. Now, Peter is saying each of you should use the gifts that you have received to serve others, not just to make a dime. For sure, we should definitely, you know, the workman is worthy of its hire. I'm not opposed to uh, using the things that God has given me to provide for my family. But I believe we always want to have that first fruits gift unto God and say, God, I want to give you my very best right on the front end. Sure, there's resources in Matthew 23, 23. If they say, you know, tithing is not in the New Testament, but sorrow awaits you. This is Jesus talking right here. You teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are careful even to tithe of the tiniest income of your herb garden. Is it herb or herb? <laughs> herb, your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Check this out. This is Jesus. He's saying that you should tithe. He didn't say you don't have to do that anymore. Just look at justice, mercy, and faith. He's saying that you should tithe, but you do not neglect the more important things. When you look at the life of Jesus, he didn't always just come to eradicate what was happening in the Old Testament, but he said, yeah, keep doing that, but then let's also take it another step. Let's take holiness to another place. Let me challenge you even more. And you say, we could barely even do what we need to do in the Old Testament. How are you going to add even more onto us? And that's where he comes back and says, it's good for you that I go. To the right hand of the Father, because the Holy Spirit's going to come now and empower you to do this greater thing. And then of our time. It's funny, sometimes I'll talk with people, especially affluent people, they have no problem throwing some money at you. But you start talking about the giving of their time, and they will rear up really big and give you all kinds of reasons why, man, I could never give of the time that I have into something as simple as just serving Others. Now, I'll give money and serve in that way, and I appreciate that. That's good. But can I tell you that time invested well, it's never lost. Time invested in the kingdom of God is never wasted. Can I give you guys the seventh ending stretch? Is anybody watching the World Series right now? Come on, stay with me. And let's look at Luke 6, 38. Hopefully by now you found it. If not, there's no hope. For Go Astros. God knows the Texans aren't ever going to win a Super Bowl, so you might as well hope that the Astros win. <laughs> a World Series. But in Luke 6, 38, notice this kingdom principle here. It says, give, and it will be given unto you. Again, don't get in the mindset this is just money. There's more than money here. Time, talents, there's so much more. It's give, and it will be given unto you. It will be given unto you in good measure. It will be pressed down. It will be shaken together, and it will run over, will be pouring into your lap for with the measure that you use. Notice God is looking for you to set the standard for what you want to receive. For with the measure that you use, then it will be measured back unto you. Holy Spirit, we come and we invite you to speak into this place. Don't let them just hear the words of a man this morning, Lord God, because I realize it doesn't matter how long I study. It doesn't matter how well I articulate these truths, God, if you are not speaking through me into the hearts and lives of each and every one of those that are in the sound of my voice, more than just even what's in this room right now, but what goes forth over YouTube and over Facebook, Lord God. Give us ears to hear your voice and a heart that understands that the truth that you have placed within our minds, that it be buried deep in our hearts and inspire change. We say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Amen and amen. You guys may be seated. Amen. Come on. Spiritual generosity positions you to receive the blessing of the Lord. Spiritual generosity, it positions you to receive the blessing that God has for your life. And notice the principle here where the world will say, you know, hoard it, save it, hide it, do whatever you can. 
and you'll be all right in the future. God's saying give. Yeah. It's a totally different aspect. It's not the mindset of I'm going to keep this for myself. It's God, I'm going to surrender it all unto you. And so I want to talk to you guys this morning about three different mindsets. And I was in Hobby Lobby the other day, and I thought, you know what, let's go for an illustration. So not only do you get a little piece of paper with three notes, but you get illustrations. I want to give you the, yeah, the illustrated sermon. <laughs> the giving mindsets. Number one, fill in the blank there, is the bag. The bag is spelled B-A-G. With the mindset of the bag, there is never enough. The mindset of the bag says there's never enough. Haggai 1.6. This is, this is huge because what God is doing, he's talking to his people right now through the prophet. And the people are taking care of their needs while the temple of the Lord is left in ruins. And God is saying, I want you to build my church. And they're saying, we will get to it eventually, God. We just have to fill our bags up enough. And notice what the prophet's response is. It says, you have sown much, and yet you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you have never had your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. Look at this. He who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. How many people does it sound like? I bust my butt week in and week out, and it's never enough. It doesn't matter how much money is in my savings account. It doesn't matter how many raises that I get throughout the, throughout the year. It's always just that feeling of it's not quite enough. What's putting holes in your bag? I want to say self-reliance. The Bible says that you seek first the kingdom of God and then everything is added unto you. That when we rely on ourselves, there's always going to be a hole in the bag. There's always that fear of the unknown. Holy Spirit understands that and that's why he brings that shalom peace, that peace that goes beyond our understanding. It's not a peace that comes because the circumstances all look like they fit into place perfectly. It's a peace that comes in knowing that our God is in control, that he was faithful yesterday, he'll be faithful today, and tomorrow he's got that under control. There's just that constant sense of fear that keeps the holes in the back, and fear is irrational. Fear does not just look at the circumstance and say, I can logically understand this and this is going to be trouble. Sure, there's problems there, but fear will take you to irrational places where it doesn't even make sense, but just in my mind, I can't reconcile it. And so there's just a sense of fear. If you want to look at somebody who was always trying to hold his own bag in the Bible, you look at a man named Judas. He followed Jesus during his ministry as one of the 12 disciples. And Jesus uh, and Judas, his job was to hold the money bag. And he didn't just take the bag because when you have a bag, you're always looking to fill it in some way. And so what Judas would do is he would always just take a little bit of extra for himself. That when he looked at the woman who broke the oil over Jesus' feet, the perfume that was said to be the value of a year's wages. So if we were here in Prosper, bring it up to 2021, and then this woman found the Coco Mademoiselle that cost like $180,000 or something like that. I believe that's the median income here uh, in the area. So she breaks this at his feet, and Judas looks at it and says, man, that could have been given to the poor. We could have given that to undefeated. But what Judas, or what Judas I keep wanting to call him Jesus, it's awful. Uh, what Judas was low-key thinking was, you know what? He give, you know, they give a little tithe off of that perfume. I could take me a little 2 or 3% out of that for myself and be good, good to go. My bag will have a little bit more in there, but it wasn't enough. She breaks it over the feet of Jesus, and so what does he do? He looks just a little bit later on, and there's some religious folks that say, hey, if you'll betray Jesus, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. You can fill that bag up a little bit more if you want to just betray the one that you love. And I tell you, that when you have the bag mentality, you will never have. Enough. People that carry that bag mentality, they never have enough time. I'm always exhausted, man. The weekend can't come fast enough, and the weekend comes, and it's not, it's not long enough. You wake up, and you're just tired. You're, exa you're exhausted. You have no room for others. And you genuinely just feel bad about doing anything that doesn't look like work. You genuinely feel bad about anything that looks like rest and recreation because you know you haven't given any of your time unto God because God knows he does, you don't have time for him. But you just look at it. It's just a constant sense of dread as we look at our day-to-day -day life. When we look in the area of resources, the bag mentality is always worried about money. It doesn't matter what's in your savings account. It doesn't matter how good that job is. They're never, even if there's enough, it's like, but I don't know, next month, maybe not. When you see a need, it just makes you anxious. It's like, oh my God, I don't wanna, I hope they don't ask me for five bucks. <laughs> it's never, there's never a heart of generosity because the bag mentality says, I don't have enough. I can't afford 
to pay my tithes. I don't care what the Bible says. I can't afford it. I can't hardly live off the 100%. How am I going to live off of the 90%? When you look at the area of talents, it's all used up Monday through Friday at work. I have nothing to give unto God. I'm just doing good to show up on a Sunday morning. I'm just doing good to just get through my week. One of the things that I love about what we're partnering with Carly on here is that we're not just going to throw some money and then defeat it and see it all work out. We're actually going to get a partner together, right? And get to make some baskets and do some cool little fancy things. And then some of you guys are going to get to go with her and, uh, and actually go to those clubs and those different areas and minister by guys and girls. Are we going to do the security? Yeah? All right. Joven, you're hired. We're going <laughs> to gonna stand out in the front, make, make sure. We're not going to let him go in, but we'll let him at least you know, hang out in the back, make sure the, the riffraff are taken care of. But our talents aren't just used up in the workplace. They're not just used up outside of the work in the ministry. And I'm not just saying on Sunday mornings. You understand, you guys are the church. You're the hands and feet of the Lord Monday through Sunday. And so we're finding ways to give. But when we carry that bag mentality, I have nothing left to give. My bag always has holes. So with the bag mentality, we say, there's never enough. But then Hobby Lobby showed me. <laughs> you, know, you know that place loves Jesus. I'm not going to carry this around looking like Red Riding Hood. I'm going to get it on this guy. So <laughs> where the bag mentality says, I never have enough. I got my little strings. I keep it nice and tight. I'm just going to put that back in my back pocket. Nobody can see what I have. I get full control. The basket mentality in Deuteronomy 28, 2 through 5. Look at this. It says, all these blessings will come on you and accompany you. Look, again, you get to set the standard. God says, I want to do this for you. I want to open up the windows of blessings over your life. But look, there is a expectation on the listener. He says, I want to do this. It will accompany you. The blessings will come if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and you will be blessed in the country. It doesn't matter if you're in California or in Texas. It doesn't matter if you're from Florida and you finally got here to Texas. It doesn't even matter if you went all the way from New York and got back here. Anywhere you go, you're going to be blessed. Yes. He goes on to say you'll be blessed in the city everywhere you go. He says the fruit of your, root, uh, of your womb will be blessed. Mm. We did that just a couple weeks ago. The generational blessing. Yes. You're going to see further on down the line that when you begin to understand the biblical mindset of generosity, that it doesn't just bless you, it doesn't just bless your kids, but it will bless your children's children. We keep on going there. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land, and the young of your livestock, the calves uh, of your herds, and the lambs of your flock. Basically, all that money, all them stocks, all that cryptocurrency is about to get blessed. And look at he says, and your baskets and your kneading troughs will be blessed. When you have the basket mindset, it, you release control, and it positions you. To give. Notice, when you have the bag mindset, it's this little bitty old thing. You got your little strings there, and you keep it up tight so nobody can ever get their hands closed. They can never see anything that you have. But I think of the story in John, where a little boy comes with his basket, his Long John Silver's lunch there, with a few fish and a little bit of bread. And it should not have been enough. You know, the Bible says there were thousands of people there, and the theologians will try to get deep on you there and talk about how, well, that was just numbering the men. Then you also got the women and the kids, and they didn't have Netflix back then, so God only knows how many kids were running around out there. But regardless, even if it was just the, the thousands of men that were out there, even if they sent all the women and kids home, there's no way that this little basket was ever going to be enough. And yet, when you have the mentality of the basket mindset there, you say, there's always enough. And so I am more than glad to bring that and give it unto God. He's more than capable to take care of everything that I need. And so notice, Jesus blesses the thing and he breaks it, but then he puts it back into the hands of those who position themselves to give. And they serve, and they serve, and they serve, and they serve, and then they get a basket in the end. We don't know what they did with those 12, but there were at least 12 disciples there at that point, so we're going to just pretend that each one walked away with a basket. The little boy came with a few loaves and a few fishes. Yes. But, the walk, but the takeaway was not just that the multitudes were fed, but even those that gave came with more than enough. Can I tell you, we want to be a people with a basket mindset. I say to you again, Matthew 6, says that when you seek first the kingdom of God. Come on, the Bible says that when you give... That's when it's positioning you for blessing. When you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all these things are added unto you. Everything that you need is found 
What have you placed the kingdom of God first? Come on, when we talk about the area of our time, when we are generous in the area of our time, when we have the basket, we understand there's always enough time. And it's not because you get extra hours in a day. The homeless guy gets the same 24 hours that Bezo gets as he's floating around up there in the you know, stratosphere in his new rocket ship. They're all working with the same 24 hours. But God has a way of multiplying those hours so that the work that you put in to those things are multiplied. That you are more effective in the things that you do. You don't have to work as hard. There's always going to be that push. There's always going to be that fight. But the Lord fights alongside you. We talked about a few weeks ago with Jericho. That Israel could have eventually taken those walls down, but it would have taken potentially years and they would have lost thousands of people in the process. But in seven days, they were able to just simply walk and celebrate the work of the Lord to give out a victory cry. And God took what would have taken years and accomplished it in just a week. God will multiply the time of those who have the basket mentality so they see that there is always enough. You're going to find there's enough time if you just spend time with the Lord in the mornings in your time of prayer. In your time with the word, you're going to have enough time for your kids. God's going to give you creativity and how you can minister to those children, to your spouse. Amen? Amen. Come on. We give God the very first, whether it be at the beginning of the year with our 21-day fast, at the beginning of the week with our Sunday mornings, beginning of the day with our prayer and our time in the word, and our resources. There's peace because I recognize that God is our source. Yes. And I tell you, I have been unemployed since April. And God provides every single, every single month. He's always been good to us. And I, I, I joke about that when I'm really employed. But <laughs> I have seen God do so many supernatural things. Everything you see around us, there's no way. We've, we've seen more money come into our possession so that we can sow back in the kingdom of God than we've ever seen at any point in 36 years of trusting in God. When you have the basket mentality, it moves you to a place where you say, I don't have to look. I used to be in the, in the place where I would check my... Uh, checking account every single weekday. It's like that's how I woke up. Is look, oh my God, okay, there's enough. You're going to be okay. I can honestly say now there's like weeks that go by and I don't even think about it because I know that God is more than capable. He is our source. He is our hope. You give as you feel led and you find joy in it. Amen. Can I just say that you can be generous and not be a follower of, of Christ, but you cannot be a follower of Christ and not be generous. Amen. You can be generous and not be a follower of Christ. You can see that in celebrities and politicians and just wealthy people in general. I was actually listening to a podcast this week by a lady that definitely did not love Jesus. But she was talking about generosity, and she just talked about how good it felt to give. Yeah. But she was enjoying it because she loved the feeling that came with it. Again, I tell you, sometimes I know I'm supposed to give with a joyful heart, and I will give. But there are times where generosity is, is calling me to move to a place where it feels a little uncomfortable sometimes. Where I don't even need to look back and see if the person's giving me thanks because it's going to steal the joy. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving unto an individual. I'm not giving unto a church. I'm giving unto God Amen. first and foremost. And then I'm going to give through a church. I'm going to give through a minister. I'm going to give to a person. That's why Jesus said, you know, you gave me a cup of water. You did this. You did that. And they said, when did we do that? He said, when you did it unto the least of these, you did it as unto me. I find joy in the giving. You move from a place when you have the bag mentality. You say, I cannot afford to tithe, you move to a place with the basket mentality where you say, I cannot afford not to tithe because I have tasted and I've seen the goodness of God. And when I begin to trust him with the first fruits of my life, man, he blesses everything. It's not just about a one-to-one -one transaction where I give $10 and he gives me $10 back. My family's healthy. There is joy in my life. I am above and not beneath. My Lord is always going before me and setting a place in the presence of my enemy. And surely his goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Why? Because I am generous. Because I trust in him. I put him first. In every area, I can't afford not to give. I can't afford not to be generous because God has just been too good to me. In the area of my talents, I come and I serve because I am empowered to do the work in the ministry. I can't just sit back and watch other people do the things that I know God has called me to do. There is something inside of me that says I have to give of all that I have because I recognize the goodness of God. And I know that if I give it, I won't be exhausted come Monday morning. I won't be exhausted come Wednesday. I won't be exhausted come Friday because there is always enough when I carry the basket mentality. Mark 10, 45 says this. It says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Come on, if God, if God comes to this earth with all the entitlement in the universe 
to have everybody just come and bow at his feet and says, no, I will come and I will give of my time. He who knew no time, who was not bound by any time, put himself into the flesh of a man and was bound by time for 33 years. He gave of his life. He gave of his time. He gave of everything that he had so that we could have relationship with him. When you have the basket mentality, you understand there is always enough. But the season of life that God is bringing us to in 2021, this isn't from Hobby Lobby. Dang, remember Toys R Us? R.I.P. Toys R Us, that giraffe is gone. <laughs> the barn mentality. You're no longer the bag mentality. We've moved beyond the basket mentality. And I believe this is where God is calling us into a season of abundance. Where in the basket, there's never enough. Where in, I'm sorry, in the bag, there's never enough. In the basket, there's enough. But in the barn, come on, there is more than enough. More than enough. In Proverbs 3 and 9.10, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. What is God wanting from us? Honestly, guys, whether it be with your time, your talents, your money, whatever it is, he's wanting your trust. He wants the trust. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Lean not on your skill set to acquire money, but in all your ways, trust in the Lord. Lean not on your skill set to succeed in the business world, but become the servant. Don't step on each and every person like, well, man, I'm telling you what, if you haven't seen the empowerment message that Ray spoke a few weeks back, you're missing it. We're down here in the muck trying to step on every single person around us to just get a little bit ahead in life when God has called us to a higher place. When we recognize who we are and we are empowered to do the work of the ministry. God's looking for people to say, I trust you. Proverbs 3, 5, 6, there it is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, all your ways, acknowledge him, and then he makes the path straight. Mm -hmm. It's not trusting yourself and just get ahead in whatever way the business world has told you to get, a, get ahead, and it's just trust in the Lord with all that you have, and then he will make the path straight. It's not about a strategy. It's about a trust in God and allow him to give you the creative ideas and the methodologies to accomplish his good and perfect will in and through your life. So again, if I can look at it one more time, your time in the barn mentality. You do not spend time when you have the barn mentality. You invest time with the barn mentality. So that, that moves you to a place, because there's this idea, I've seen it in church, I've seen it in the business world, where people don't want to invest into others because then if I pour into you, then what's that gonna mean for me? Am I going to get bumped out of the job if I start pouring into your life? But God has called us to make, to pour into others, to serve others. And so we give of our time knowing that there is more than enough. That as I pour into one, that it's going to elevate me to that next level. And I'm going to hear that well done, good and faithful servant. Those that took time to uh, steward the talents well in the, uh, in the proverb there, or in the parable, they were given more. It wasn't like, okay, well, you have that enough. Now you can go sit down. No, we're going to give you more. And now you're going to be faithful with even another level. The thing that you never thought was possible whenever you invested. Notice the guy that invested always had more. The guy that knew how to work under the sweat of his own brow, he was taken care of well. The one that was afraid, that had the bag mentality, he just hid it because he was working out of fear. The next level guy that got the five talents, he got... He got extra, but he did it under his own power. The guy that was at the top level was not the hard worker so much as the wise investor. It's a really good little principle that we'll dig into some other time. I don't have time to unpack all that. But that, that bar mentality says that I invest. I invest in my kids. I invest into my spiritual uh, growth. And I'm going to spend time in the word. But I'm going to see that time multiplied because the Holy Spirit's going to make these truths come alive in me. I come with that expectation that when I'm uh, carrying the bar mentality in the area of resources, I'm looking to be the vessel that God wants to use. I'm looking for ways to pour in. I'm not waiting for opportunities to come to me. I am actually actively pursuing. Why? Because I understand that I serve a God that is more than enough. So it's not like I'm having to fight just to make ends meet. I'm not just looking at it with this basket mentality that says, okay, I got enough. I'm good, so I don't have to worry. It's now I'm actively pursuing, God, how can I bless others? How can I see beyond myself? And I said it earlier, but I want to give you the actual address here in Proverbs 13, 22. When we learn how to be generous, with our resources. It says a good man 
leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Come on, when you're in the bag mentality, I'm not even thinking about my children's children. In fact, when I start thinking about children's children, I think about the fact that I got three girls that have to get married. <laughs> that puts me right back into the bag. <laughs> but I'm operating in the barn mentality. I got a God that is a God of more than enough. And so I don't have to just worry about Olivia and Annabelle and Violet, but I believe somewhere down the line we're going to break this generational curse of only having girls in the house. And we're going to see at least one boy pop out of one of those kids over there. And I will leave an inheritance for my children's children because I carry a barn mentality that God is not just enough, but he's a God of more than enough, that I'm not just trying to figure out how I can tithe, but when you carry the barn mentality, you stop measuring out your offerings and you just say, God, it's 100% yours. Whatever you want. I'm not even worried about it because my source is not the name on the upper left-hand side of the check. I don't care whose name it is. I don't care what the company is. That's not it. It's the author and the finisher of my faith. It is God the Father that is my provider. It's Jehovah Jireh. He who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He who is the God of more than enough that does supernatural things in order to show himself faithful time and time again. That when we carry the barn mentality with our talents, we stand on the word that says, you know, one person can put a thousand to flight. Two people, they don't put two thousand to flight because we serve a God of multiplication. It is ten thousand. That when we bring somebody else alongside of us and we say, let me, let me lead you, let me show you how to activate the kingdom principles in your life. Come on in on a Monday or Tuesday in a Bible study group and submit yourself to a process of growth, of supernatural growth. And let us partner. We're not going to just see double our investment, but it'll be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people will come and hear the word of the Lord. So where is your mindset this morning? Do you have the bag? Are you the basket? Or do you have the barn? Even if you have the barn mentality, if you are like breaking your arm in the process of trying to pat yourself on the back, there's an opportunity for Holy Spirit to bring greater revelation, to tear down that barn and build a bigger one. Because my God is not done with you. My God is more than enough. He's more than capable. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. And so practical ways, we're going to close it out in this. Come on up. Home. Romans 12, 2. It says very pointedly, it says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. There's a mindset that needs to be transformed. It doesn't say that you need to change your circumstances. It doesn't say that you need to get more money. It's saying you need to lean into the Holy Spirit and allow him to transform your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and his pleasing, his perfect will. Holy Spirit, give us a transformation. I was talking to the guy that cuts my hair every two weeks, and I, this guy lives a wild life. I mean, he's like in his 50s, and he's like at the club, and then he goes from the club to some strip club down there in Dallas, and then after the strip club, he'll leave that at like 4 in the morning and go up to Oklahoma and spend a couple hundred dollars at the casino. And I tell him, Q, I'm like, bro, I said, you're just, I don't know if you're going to make it from week to week. Like, I legitimately am kind of looking low-key for another hairstylist because I'm like, I don't know if this guy's going to be alive when I see him. And we joke, we have a good time. Half the time, he's so high that I think I'm getting a contact high just by being close to the dude. But I love him to death, and I know God has a purpose and a plan for his life, and I really kind of hope that he is watching this morning because he said something extremely insightful. He said, you know, I came from Mississippi and the way that we were raised down there was just, you live off of government help and you do whatever you can to steal from others or swindle others. He was talking about how his dad, you know, got hit by Alexis and uh, basically got some money that he's still riding on, you know, years later type of thing. And he said, you know, when I moved from Mississippi over here into the Prosper area, He's like, I start talking to the people that are cutting my, that I'm cutting their hair for. He's like, and these guys think totally different. He's like, I started hearing about investments, you know, and multiple streams of income, you know, saving. He's like, well, I didn't, I didn't learn any of that. He's like, I, he's, I've only been over here since November. I went back to Mississippi this past week, and these guys thought I was all bougie. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> like, who are you? We don't know nothing about this. Sometimes we just need to change our situation. We need to change the surroundings, the people that we're interacting with. Toxic environments. You can't fly with the eagles if you're running with the turkeys. <laughs> There's some practical steps to this. I close.
close this with the scripture. You guys can stay with me. It says Hebrews 12, 2. I hear Holy Spirit saying, come up higher with me. To fix your eyes upon me. To move up to that higher place that Ray was talking about so that you recognize the power that you are given through the work of the Holy Spirit. 